Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We are gathered today on the 23rd of the eighth month on our Creator's calendar, which is the 5th of November on the Gregorian calendar for 2022. And we're continuing with our reading and study of Bereshit, or Genesis, and we're currently on chapter 5. I was not able to edit this completely, so I apologize. I want to show some things that you might not be too familiar with, but um, we'll we'll get there. And then anything that isn't in here, I'll try to add to the comments later. So Bereshith or Genesis chapter 5 says, This is the recounting or the sefer of the genealogy of Adam. In the day created Elohim man, in the resemblance of Elohim, he made Eth him. And this one is very significant because if you recall, our Mashiach only does what he sees and only says what he hears. So the fact that he made man in the resemblance of him is because he was made in the resemblance of the father. So as it was done, so he was doing it. And that's like that hand in the glove, hand in the glove thing again. This is male and female, he created them, and he barak or blessed Eth them, and called Eth their name Adam in the day they were created. Now, Adam is pretty significant as a word. It means it means man. It's related to Adam, which is red, and Aleph as a prefix means I will or I am, and dam is bleeding, so I will bleed. But what I did not know until, or I didn't remember at least until just today, was that the image, <clears throat> or sorry, the likeness right here, Bidmut, the likeness of him is literally dalit mem hey as a word so we look at that real quick and you can see i will or i am the likeness or similitude is also is also a meaning of adam there and he is the similitude of our mashiach if you right if you remember from dama to be like or resemble. So Adam is the one who is like or resembling our Mashiach or Elohim, which is also the truth, which is literally in the Hebrew language here. So Ab willing, you can see how these words that are literally spelled the same, spelled similar, have the same letters, not different ones. And then the meaning actually fits with what actually is in reality. So the truth bears witness, if you will. And that is the benefit of looking at the Hebrew language for all of these things in Scripture, by the way. But it says, And Adam lived 130 years and brought forth a son in his own resemblance, like his image, and called Eth his name Seth, or Sheth. And this is where we get the English word for Set. Because if you remember, he was appointed in place of the one that they lost. And after he brought forth at Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years, and he brought forth sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. One thing I'd like to mention real quick, the genealogy timeline in the Masoretic text here is not correct. The timeline that you can find in Josephus is also not correct. The, these timelines were intentionally muddled with because the adversary was given permission to do so. If you remember, no man knows the day or the hour, not even the messengers nor the son, but the father alone. So if we can't know, the adversary is permitted to hide it. And that's exactly what they did with tampering with these genealogies. But you also have to keep in mind that anyone who adds to these words will have all those plagues written in the book added to them. 
And anyone who takes away from these words will have his name taken out of the book of life. <clears throat> and Seth lived 105 years and brought forth Eth Enosh. And after he brought forth Eth Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and brought forth sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth or Sheth were 912 years, and he died. And Enosh lived 90 years and brought forth Eth Canaan. And after he brought forth Eth Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years and brought forth sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. And Canaan, or Canaan, sorry, lived 70 years and brought forth Eth Mahalalel. I'm sorry, you probably don't know what the names mean, or I'll, I'll run through them real quick. Adam is man, Seth appointed, right? And then you have Enosh is the word for man, but it's also meaning mortal, as in braille, or someone who is sick, can become sick. Let me find that one again. I'm pretty sure we talked about that last week. Do you all remember that? Vaguely, it's familiar, so it had to have been from here. <laughs> See, it's in soft or delicate, enosh, but it's also in the uh, frail. That one covers it a little bit, but doesn't say too much. All right, I'll find that better etymology for you later. Sometimes, and I did it with Sefer, the word for the, this is the books. That was another one right there. When you look at the word suffer, it's just like the, the word that they used in the anti mashiach for dummies. When they changed Biblionary or Bibliaridian rather into a little book. But in reality, books didn't exist back then and they never used that for that word. In the same way right here, they have book for sefer. And a book didn't exist until after the times or contemporary with the times of Yahukanon, where the Biblian or the Bibliaridian were like the codexes that they started making. So that book is not an accurate translation in any capacity, but that's how they translate this word most of the time. However, especially with the Strongs here, if you click through, you can go, there's multiple different entries for that same three-letter spelling and they all have different meanings so you really have to dig you'll have to look through every one and see how it's used throughout the scriptures here's enumeration and census right and then you can go the other direction too this is a book again but it's never it, there was no such thing as a book when this was originally written And this is where it's talking about to count, recount, or relate, which is the original meaning of this word. And if you recall, when Elohim took Abraham out and he said, look at the stars and suffer them if you're able to suffer, or to recount or count them, right? So is your seed, meaning they're going to be numerous as the stars of the Shamayim, and the literal story that's recounted in the sky by the luminaries is going to be from him. All true, all part of the word, same thing as the that word that we just went over too. But to get back on track, you can really go through rabbit holes and dig. I just wanted to show you with that one word, this is the importance of looking at the Hebrew or just like they do. It's far more prevalent in the book of Revelation because they really wanted to hide things from us. And that is very well exposed in the antichrist for dummies video series so i highly recommend you watch that and test everything because they're not accurate on everything that they share <clears throat> but generally you see it throughout scripture as well here's one example and they do it with a few other words too but back on point so enosh means mortal as in man but frail and it says uh, we were past that part. 
Canaan, I can't remember exactly how I had that. They don't always have these words um, easily. Is it appointed? That would be Seth was appointed mortal. Okay. And then I think Canaan was sorrow is how they had that translated. But I don't know if that's what they have here. So I want to check and see. Bulldog. It they have it as a spear right here. And that's actually how it's used to read a spear in first Shemuel. As in fast striking. How that can mean sorrow, I'm not exactly sure, but the etymology was also um the etymology for some of these words were not found in, in the strongest concordance when I was digging through myself. And I don't know if that was how they came up with that. So I'll have to look. But I know there's a lady named Frances Roslin who wrote a book called The Maserote. And she went through and found some very interesting names for the etymologies of these words, for the names of these patriarchs and other things as well. And I think I, I derived some of them from her, like the word for the name for a park shad is a congregation assembled and you won't find that anywhere in the strong but she dug it up back in the 1800s so and after he brought forth eth cain enosh lived 815 years and brought forth sons and daughters so all the days of enosh were 905 years and he died and canaan lived 70 years and brought forth eth mahalalel and this is the means or the place of ma halel it, praising el. So they translate it as the praiseworthy el, but it's the, the place or the means of, of praising el, like hallelujah. Okay. And after he brought forth eth ma halalel, Canaan lived 840 years and brought forth sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 900 years, or 910 years, and he died. And Mahalalel lived 65 years and brought forth Eth Yerad, or Jared as they call him, right? And after he brought forth Eth Yerad, which literally means he will come down, Mahalalel lived 830 years and brought forth sons and daughters, so all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. And Yerad lived 162 years, and brought forth Eth Hanok. And after he brought forth Eth Hanok, Yerad lived 800 years, and brought forth sons and daughters. So all the days of Yerad were 962 years, and he died. And Hanok lived 65 years and brought forth Eth Methuselah. Sorry, Hanok means dedicated. They also have it translated as teaching. And then Methuselah is his death. Methu shall bring Shalach. Okay. And after he brought forth Eth Methuselah, Hanok walked with El, or with Eth the Elohim, and that's how it's actually translated. It's with Eth Ha Elohim. 300 years and brought forth sons and daughters. So all the days of Hanok were 365 years. And Hanok walked with Eth the Elohim. Then he was no more, for Elohim took Eth him. And Methuselah lived 187 years and brought forth Eth Lemek, which is despairing, right? Or sorrow. And after he brought forth Eth Lemek, Methuselah lived 782 years and brought forth sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. And Lemek lived 182 years and brought forth a son. 
and called Eth his gem or name Noah, <clears throat> saying, This one does comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which Yahuwah has cursed. And Noah means comfort or rest. And after he brought forth Eth Noah, Lemek lived 595 years and brought forth sons and daughters. So all the days of Lemek were 777 years, and he died. And Noach was 500 years old, and Noach brought forth Shem, Ham, and Japheth. It doesn't give you the order they were born here. It gives you the names, but that doesn't mean that that was the order they were born. You'll, you'll see that sometimes they don't do that. And in the book of Yobelim, they actually have the Yobel and the specific times where each one of them was born. I tend to believe that's probably the most accurate genealogy or timeline that you can have, but it is only one witness in itself. You do have supplementary witnesses, but nothing with direct dates as far as I'm aware. I'm still learning. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, it also admits that the, the year Yahushua brought them into the land was the Yobel. In Yobelim, it says that it was specifically the 50th Yobel from creation. So um, you have, uh, yeah, it was the 50th Yobel. So you have supplementary evidence that shows that it could be, but nothing's set in stone. And again, we're not supposed to, we, we can't know the day and the hour when he's going to return, but these things will be perfected for us. All right, chapter six. It says, and it came to be when men began to increase on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of Elohim saw the daughters of men, that they were good, and they took the wives for themselves of all whom they chose. There's a lot of things about what people have opinions about this stuff, but if you look at the book of Hanok, if you look at Second Baruch, if you look at the leave fourth Ezra, there's also the exhortation from the Damascus document in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. I believe also in the Apostolic Constitutions, the homilies of Clement and the recognitions. They all make very clear that this was speaking of messengers who mated with women, took whomever they would, married or not, and then their children were what we'd call the Titans. And then their children were the giants or the Nephilim. And there was three descending orders, as you can find in Hanok. And not to get into that too much, we'll read it when we get there. But the point is, people will say that this was just another seed of men or come up with a different line from Cain or whatever. And that's nowhere. There is no witness for that anywhere else in Scripture. You might find some perversions in the book of Jasher that they currently have. But the versions of Jasher that exist today are not scripture. It, it's patently provable that it's contrary to the book of Yobelim and the common scriptures and the testament of Yahuda and other writings. I've had personal witnesses come to me when I've asked about that on, online, where they've mentioned that pretty much any time you find something in error from the book of Jasher, you can find where it comes from, from the Talmud. So after I've learned that and I've seen for myself, the discrepancies multiple i no longer had any regard for it i've never read that it's perverted many people's comprehensions one great example it, and i'll give you two the way that cain killed hevel or abel is different and the retaliation that happened and then also how e how edom died it, there's two different accounts jasher has what is not accurate the book of Yobelim and the Testament of Yahuda share the same versions of what happened. You can find numerous other examples of these things. So um, one egregious, one very egregious um, error is the idea that Abraham was a contemporary to Nimrod. They were generations apart for one, and Nimrod, actually his daughter married Eber, Eber was the great grandfather of Abraham, not, not his contemporary. 
So moving on. Verse 3, it says, And Yahu has said, My Ruach shall not strive with man forever in his going astray. He is flesh, and his days shall be 120 years. And this is another particular verse that people will take because they don't have another witness in the common scriptures. They just make it up to fit whatever inclination pops into their mind. But we're not to do that. And this is actually written specifically in the Dead Sea Scrolls where the 120 years was because Yahuwah said that in the 480th year of Noah's life. Ab willing, we'll see that in just a minute. Or in a little bit here. Sorry about that. This is the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of Elohim came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who are of old, the men of name or renown. And Yahuwah saw that the inequity of man was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And Yahuwah was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And Yahuwah said, I am going to wipe off man whom I have created from the face of the ground, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the Shemaim, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noach found favor in the eyes of Yahuwah. This is the Tovadot or genealogy of Noach. Noach was a righteous man, perfect in his generations. Noach walked with Elohim. And here's another one. I'm only pointing these out because these are prevalent doctrines that people are starting to believe today. But they'll say, they'll take this part that he's perfect in his generations and they, they make up or they come up with this idea that this is about his DNA and that he wasn't corrupted that way. But you can look up the word tamim and you can find out what it means in scripture. And to be perfect in scripture is to not openly sin. It has nothing to do with your DNA. So you, people can cling to the error. They can make things up if they want to, but it's not, it's not something that we should do. It has no good end. Verse 10, it says, And Noach brought forth three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth was corrupt before Elohim, and the earth was filled with violence. And Elohim looked upon the earth and saw that it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And that is a perfect example of the difference in nuance here with you, when you have all. There's two uses in the Hebrew, or two uses in the Greek in particular, qualitative and quantitative. And when it says all, it's almost always quantitative or qualitative, sorry. It's all kinds and not every single one because we know Noah was not corrupt in his flesh and the animals that they took, there was nothing wrong with them. There were some animals, as if you take the time to look in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's fragments from what's called the Book of the Giants and you get a little more detail about what was going on with them. But uh, not to get into too much into that right now, the messengers also changed into animals and made monsters. And that's where we get a lot of the uh, mythology from the Greeks perverted. But a lot of the ideas that came from is just stories from these demons and these monsters that were created by these things. <clears throat> However, it was not every single kind. It was just all types, all kinds but not every single last one. And Elohim said to Noach, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And see, I am going to destroy them from the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with a covering. And this is how you are to make it. The length of the ark is 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Make a window for the ark 
and complete it to a cubit from above, and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. And see, I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under the Shemaim. All that is on the earth is to die. And I shall establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of all the flesh, or and of all the living of all flesh, two of each you are to bring into the ark to keep them alive with you, a male and a female, of the birds after their kind, and of the cattle after their kind, and of all the creeping things of the ground after their kind. Two of each are to come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take of all food that is eaten and gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. And Noah did according to all that Elohim commanded him, so he did. And here's the key that you can see in the beginning. While disobedience brings death, obedience brings deliverance from death. Very simple. <clears throat> Just one moment. All right, and we're on Bereshit, Genesis chapter 7. It says, And Yahuwah said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. And another witness for this is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's in a, a writing they call the Genesis Apocryphon. But in reality, I believe it is the original book of Jasher, if you will, or Yeshar, the upright. I can't prove that, but it's literally the compiled writings, first-hand writings of the um, patriarchs. So when you look at them, it's the writing of Lemek, and you have the birth of Noah, and then you have the first-hand account of Noah in his person, where he's writing about it himself. And he said that in, in that, when you see that he was born righteous in his generations, and the things that happened were all foreordained. So it's rather interesting, but if it is in fragments. After Noah, you have Abraham or Abram writing in the first person the things that he was doing that you can read in Genesis as well. Very interesting stuff. I highly recommend anyone read all of these writings. It's for our edification and benefit. But he says, And Yahuwah said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Of all the clean beasts, take with you seven pairs, a male and his female, and of the beasts that are unclean, two, a male and his female, and of the birds of the Shemaim, seven pairs, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more Yamim, or days, I am sending rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights and shall wipe from the face of the earth all that stand that have that I created. And Noah did according to all that Yahuwah commanded him. Now Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his son's wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of the clean beasts and of the beasts that are unclean, and of birds, and of all that creep on the earth. Two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as Elohim commanded Noah. And it came to be after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of the Shemaim were opened. And the rain was on the earth forty days and forty nights. On that same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Yepheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife, 
and the three wives of his sons with them went into the ark. They in every form after its kind, and every beast after its kind, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah, two by two, of all flesh in which is the breath of life. And those going in, male and female of all flesh, went in as Elohim had commanded him, and Yahuwah shut him in. And the flood was on the earth forty days, and the waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. And the waters were mighty and greatly increased on the earth. And the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters were exceedingly mighty on the earth, and all the high mountains under all the Shemaim were covered. The waters became mighty, fifteen cubits upward, and the mountains were covered, and all flesh died. The creeping thing on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every swimming, or sorry, and every swarming creature that swarms on the earth and all mankind. All in whose nostrils was the breath of the Ruach of life, all that was on the earth or on the dry land died. So he wiped off all that stand, which were on the face of the ground, both man and beast, creeping creature and bird of the Shemaim. And they were wiped off from the earth. And Noah was left, and those with him in the ark. And the waters were mighty on the earth one hundred and fifty days. All right, now we're on chapter eight. And after this one, we'll read the account from the book of the Dead Sea Scrolls. You can see that they have a different one or a different. It's the same account, but they have a different way of putting it where they line it up distinctly with the. Uh, with the calendar. It says, and Elohim remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And Elohim made a wind or ruach to pass over the earth. And the waters subsided, and the fountains of the deep, and the windows of the Shemaim were stopped, and the rain from the Shemaim was withheld. And the waters receded steadily from the earth, and at the end of the hundred and fifty days the water diminished. And in the seventh Chodesh, or month, the seventeenth day of the month, the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat, and the waters decreased steadily until the tenth month. And in the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Again, I didn't have a chance to edit this. This is from the TS 2009 edition. The original ISR 98 and before did not have moon, but accurately had month. And it was when C.J. Coster, the, the man who made that translation, was still alive after he passed away, which he also proclaimed the name of Yahushua. I, I believe that he might have been a martyr, but I don't know for certain. After he passed at a young age, though, his translation was taken over by someone else and the newer versions perverted this and a few other areas that I really don't agree with. But it says, on the first of the month the tops of the mountains became visible and it came to be at the end of 40 days that noah opened the window of the ark which he had made and he sent out a raven which kept going out and turning back until the waters had dried up from the earth then he sent out a dove from him and see if the water to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground but the dove found no resting place for its feet and returned into the ark to him. For the waters were on the face of all the earth. So he put out his hand and took it and pulled it into the ark to himself. And he waited yet another seven days. And again, he sent the dove out from the ark. 
And the dove came to him in the evening. And see, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in its mouth. And Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. And he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return to him again. And it came to be in the six hundred and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and saw the surface of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the twenty-seventh day of the month, the earth was dry. And Elohim spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every life form of all flesh that is with you, of birds, of cattle, and of all creeping things, the creeping things on the earth. And let them teem on the earth and bear an increase on the earth. So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, and every beast, every creeping creature, and every bird, whatever creeps on the earth, according to their kinds, went out of the ark. And Noah built a slaughter place to Yahuwah, and took of every clean beast and of every clean bird, and offered ascending offerings on the slaughter place. And Yahuwah smelled a soothing fragrance. And Yahuwah said in his heart, Never again shall I curse the ground because of man, although the inclination of his man's heart is evil from his youth. And never again strike all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth remains, see time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. Now, this is very important because as long as the earth remains until the Shem, right, the Shemayim and the earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away, is what our Mashiach said. So there is a time where the earth will be burnt up, if you will. And then we will have the renewed earth afterwards, in which right in, the, in which place righteousness dwells, and there will be no more sin. After that time, there will be no more seasons or day and night like we have it either, if you recall. <clears throat> and all of that is to teach us and help us to know where we are in history and what we're required to do as we wait. So, of willing, we can see that more and more as we go. But just one moment, and I will get that other one put up for us. All right, shalom again, and everyone. This is from the study edition of the Dead Sea Scrolls, 4Q252. It's called a commentary on Genesis, right? But in reality, it's a uh, second witness to the flood account. So, right here it says, in the 480th year of Noah's life, Noah reached the end of them. And Elohim said, My Ruach will not reside in man forever. Their days shall be fixed at 120 years until the end of the waters of the flood. And here's the context for that quote. That this makes two witnesses. You have what's in their sheet and you have what's right here that go hand in hand. And this is why our Mashiach said, at the mouth of two or more witnesses, every matter shall be established. Because you can literally do this for every single point of any type of doctrine or any opinion you have in Scripture. You have to prove it with multiple witnesses, or you can't be dogmatic. Otherwise, you're not following what the truth said to do. He says, and the waters of the flood burst over the earth in the 600 year of Noah's life in the second month, on the first of the week, on its 17th. So you can see, and this is where it gets very specific. The first yom of the week is the 17th day of the second month. That never changes on his calendar. It always stays that way. It is always going to be that way. And I'll show you in just one moment. Did you approach? Oh, sorry, did brother. Did you appropriate that calendar, or did you create that yourself? 
This was actually the work of Jerry Morris and his team. I don't know if he put it together personally or if someone did it for him, but okay, I give him full credit for the picture that you see before you, other than those red circles. After I got this calendar from him and he sent it to me with a few other things in an email, including the Zedekite, um, he took the time to write out the list of all the Kohanim that served and what order they served for a 294 year period as it's enumerated in the scrolls. So he wrote that out and then he put it in a PDF and he made copies of it and he gave that out as well. Um, I have that at two, but the only thing I did with the calendar and we've shared it in the telegram, I've added the other days, like the, the, the feast of Hanukkah, Perum, the, the deliverances and the celebrations that they kept in the Maccabees and other places that are mentioned in scripture, I, I put in there so you can see them. Other than that, it's the calendar that he made. And this right here is that unchanging calendar specifically in relation to the flood, right? So as you can see, the, the first yom of the week, the 17th yom of the second month, and it never changes. It repeats itself in a 364 day pattern which is perfect. But all of these are the specific dates that things happened as we're going to read with the flood account. Okay. So I wanted everyone to be able to see that. And then we'll get back to actually what we're reading right now. Just give me one moment. All right. So now that you have seen that, we're going to go ahead and read through this and then I won't, I won't make any more pauses, but you can get a sense for the exact dates of what happened and how it lines up, okay? It says, In the year 600 of Noah's life, in the second month, on the first of the week, on its 17th, on that day, all the springs of the great abysses, or all the springs of the great abyss were split, and the sluices, or the windows of the sky, the Shemaim, opened and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights until the 26th day of the third month the fifth day of the week 150 days did the waters hold sway over the earth until the 14th day of the seventh month excuse me i'm sorry about that All right, I'm sorry about that. I'm going to start right here just to <clears throat> continue. And it says, 150 days did the waters hold sway over the earth until the 14th day of the seventh month, the third of the week. At the end of 150 days, and just so you know, the idea that the days are specifically set and they don't change is not just in this one text it's literally all over the dead sea scrolls it throughout the calendar writings it gives very specific dates for very specific things that are ever forever unchanging so this is one of many but this is also one that actually proves it which is why we're going through it this is at the end of 150 days the waters came down two days the fourth day and the fifth day and the sixth sorry you have the hebrew and then the english intermixed in the study edition which i highly recommend if anyone's learning hebrew to to study it for themselves but in the sixth day the ark rested on the mountains of ararat it was the 17th day of the seventh month and the waters continued diminishing until the 10th month on its first, the fourth day of the week. The peaks of the mountains began to be visible. And at the end of 40 days, when the peaks of the mountains had become visible, Noah opened the window of the ark on the first day of the week, which is the 10th day of the 11th month. And he sent out the dove to see whether the waters had diminished. But it did not find a place of rest and return to him to the ark. And he waited yet another seven days and again sent it out, and it returned to him. 
and in its beak there was a newly plucked olive leaf. It was the 24th, it was the 24th of the 11th month, the first of the week. And Noah knew that the waters had diminished from upon the earth. And at the end of another seven days, he sent the dove out, but it did not come back again. It was the first day of the 12th month, the first day of the week. And at the end of 30 days, after having sent out the dove, which did not come back again, the waters dried up from, the, or from upon the earth, and Noah removed the cover of the ark and looked. And behold, they had dried up on the fourth day of the week, on the first of the first month. In the 601 or first of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, the land dried up on the first of the week. On that day, Noah went out of the ark, and at the end of the complete year of 364 days, on the first of the week, on the seventh one, or, or, this is where it, it's kind of, the writing here is a little messed up, and this is why it doesn't read accurately quite, quite right here. It was like a typo, if you will, for whoever's writing the text. But it says, and on the 17th and 1, 6th, Noah from the ark at the appointed time of a complete year. And if you recall, it mentions in Yob Elim too, he, he looked and saw it was dry on the 17th, and then he waited a week and let him out on the 27th, which is exactly what you can read in their sheet, their Genesis, that they went out on the 27th of the second month. It was 10 days after a full year. <clears throat> And Noah woke from his wine, or there we go, this is after that point. So this is no longer what we need to concern ourselves with. I really wanted to read the account of the flood here, which you just saw, and how it lines up perfectly with our creator's calendar. And while it does have things that are not in the book of Genesis, it is not contradictory in any capacity. In the same way you can find Kings and Chronicles, have differing things, but they're not incompatible. And Yobelim and Bereshit of Genesis have different things, but they're not incompatible. They go congruent with one another. So Ab willing, more and more we'll be able to see that and get a firm grasp in our mind what the truth is for all of our benefits. I appreciate all your time and you have a wonderful Shabbat. Y'all who will be with you. Okay.